Thank you very much. Um, I was asked to speak for a few minutes on the dodgy wound and how to deal with a dodgy wound, both in the inpatient setting and in the outpatient setting. And I'm going to restrict myself to dodgy wounds after fracture fixation and not dodgy wounds after alteroplasty. So uh, disclosures, um, they're, they're up on the screen um, from me, from Medtronic, and the unit from Smith and Nephew. So uh, to look at the dodgy wound, first of all, you've got to look at what is dodgy. So I looked at the uh, dictionary definitions of dodgy, and the first is obviously irrelevant to the talk. Uh, false or dishonest, but the next two, you know, look good, causing a lack of trust or confidence and in bad condition. And the last definition of dodgy in the dictionary is requiring skill or care in handling or coping with. So I think it's, you know, even though it sounds dodgy, talking about dodgy wounds, I think the definition makes it quite appropriate that we, um, that we use the term dodgy to describe wounds like this. So here's an inpatient wound. She's had um, a long stem hemiarthroplasty. It's four or five days post-op. And you can see that the wound is a bit shiny. And at the left-hand bottom side, you can see there's a bit of a noose. And it's just soaking the bed clothes. What do you do with this patient? Are you going to say, it's going to be fine. I see this ooze all the time. It's, it's, it's not infected. Are you just going to send the patient home? Are you going to keep her in? Are you going to aggressively open every wound that looks like this? And are you going to try to, um, you know, do to, to what potentially may be too many things for this patient? So what do we do first to check whether it's infected or not? All of us check inflammatory markers. And there's been a wealth of published literature about inflammatory markers after arthroplasty but very little about inflammatory markers after trauma surgery. And that's because, number one, trauma surgery is not too exciting. And number two, because trauma surgery is an entire spectrum of operations from complex femoral nailing to simple ankle fractures. However, there's been one paper that looked at about 800 patients looking at a whole spectrum of trauma operations and looking at their CRP levels after surgery. And what this paper found was that there are two broad trends of CRP measurements after surgery for trauma. And I've just shown the graph with the median values in them. Obviously, there are 95% confidence intervals, etc. But you can see that in the truly infected ones, after about day four, the CRP keeps on rising. And there's no, not much point checking it at day two or three because it's going to be high, whether it's a normal wound or one that's potentially going to get infected. But after about day four, if you spot a rising trend in the CRP, it's very likely that you are dealing with an infected wound. Obviously, you've got to rule out other causes of an increased CRP, such as a urinary tract infection or even cardiac problems, etc. But in the absence of those problems, it is suggested in this paper that if you have a CRP of more than 96 after day four, you, in the absence of other problems, you are very likely to be dealing with a deep wound infection. So this is a useful test for us to do at about the fourth or the fifth day post-op. What else can we do? Xavier alluded to this, and I think this has a role in the wounds that we have a doubt as to whether it's infected. There's a bit of an exudate, and I think there's not much doubt that there's a role for negative pressure wound therapy, probably in the portable format for the oozy wound or for the leaky wound in the inpatient setting. However, again, as Xavier said, there is some fiction and a lot of facts about negative pressure wound therapy. There's no doubt at all that negative pressure wound therapy helps significantly in removing the tissue exudate. So it's going to be very good for you to deal with the oozy wound to get rid of all the serum fluid and to make it more dry. There is some evidence that 
it actually improves vascularity in the wound and may promote wound healing by improving vascularity and getting all the good cells to proliferate. However, there is very little evidence or very dubious evidence that it actually helps in treating an early infected wound. So there is some data that you'll see about bacterial cell counts decreasing with negative pressure wound therapy. However, these are not robust data, and if you look for robust data, as I've put the reference at the bottom, you'll find that the amount of robust data to help uh, you to suggest that negative pressure wound therapy is the way forward to deal with an acutely infected wound is very little. So don't try negative pressure wound therapy for more than about two weeks. So here's a summary. Problem wound, inpatient, four to five days, two inflammatory markers, consider negative pressure wound therapy, senior assessment of the wound at 72 hours after that, not, you know, delegating a core trainee to do it, but senior assessment of the ward at 72 hours. It's going to do one or two things. It's going to improve, in which case you can continue the negative pressure wound therapy until your wound heals, typically about two weeks. But if your CRP is worsening, clinically it's worsening, you've got to consider that this could be deep infection and consider a washout. So that's the inpatient setting. What about the outpatient wounds? And here's a selection of pictures from our problem wound elective clinic. What do you do with these? You know, these are coming in. Typically, they get referred by the GP. Uh, somebody takes a phone call. They're brought to a fracture clinic many days later. And that really should not be the way forward for these patients because what you don't want is for these wounds to land up like that, particularly in the trauma situation. So here's a suggestion. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a thought process that could help. Arthroplasty services have problem wound clinics, particularly in a hospital, and they do really well. And I think that all trauma patients should be given discharge information about problem wounds, and they should have telephonic access to a problem wound clinic and should be seen the next day in the problem wound clinic. And they should have, you know, easy access to it. And the problem wound clinic should have access to bloods as well as an urgent ultrasound. Does the ultrasound help? It does. And here's two pictures, one of a tibial pilon fracture wound of mine. It is done through a postromedial incision, bit of a swelling, bit of redness. Do I go in, do I clean it up, or do I tell the patient it's going to be okay? Here's an ultrasound done by a good musculoskeletal radiologist. Here's the report. I won't go into the details, but it says there's no collection. It's going to be fine. Here's another ultrasound of a hip wound presenting with a leak after two and a half weeks. I mean, you and I can see that hematoma, but here's the ultrasound report. It says there's a large hematoma. It's deep, and, but the patient refused an aspiration. And most importantly, I like the last line, you know. This shows that the radiologist has actually picked up the phone and said, I'm going to speak to the orthopedic registrar and tell him that I found a deep hematoma and it needs something doing. So the problem wound after discharge, I think all hospitals should have access to a problem wound clinic where they should have the ability to do bloods and consider a musculoskeletal ultrasound. and based on your bloods and your musculoskeletal ultrasound and the results of, uh, of these, I think we can more or less come to diagnosis as to whether an acute problem wound needs further surgery or whether we can observe it. But at all costs, please do not ignore a deep hematoma and a problem with the CRP, particularly if it's rising, because if it doesn't come to haunt you in the next week, it'll come back after a year. Thank you very much.